You are about to see Donica Margergard speaking on tools for large-scale grassland restoration at the UCSE Kresge Town Hall on May 14, 2015. The event was hosted by the Kresge Common Ground Center, Education for a Just and Sustainable World. For more information, visit kresge.ucse.edu backslash common ground. Um, so, 99% of farmers are destroying the very resources that we need for farming. Uh, conventional agriculture uh, results in water pollution, um, pesticide poisoning of beneficial predators and pollinators, soil erosion, the destruction of the soil food web, and also um, degradation of ecosystems. So um, I often ask myself, what's the logic of a food system that's supposed to be providing sustenance while overlooking such outrageous destruction? Benin Benyes, the renowned biologist who um, developed the concept of biomimicry, uh, which is looking to nature to inform how we design human systems, said life creates conditions conducive to life. I consider Donaga Markegaard a radical eco-rancher. Radical in that she refuses to accept uh, the idea that producing food should hurt ecosystems. Radical in that she's not just doing a little less harm, but her practices at Markegaard grass-fed are working with nature to rehydrate the landscape, to promote vibrant uh, grasslands, to produce healthy animals and healthy food, while creating the capacity of her lands to become a thriving, regenerative ecosystem. Donaga is part of the lineage of the brilliant, of the, of the agricultural lineage of the brilliant Joel Salatin and the innovative Aaron Doherty, who have rejected the failed industrial uh, agricultural system and are farming with nature by using ecosystem perspective to produce food. So uh, we're really happy and privileged to have Donica Marcus for us today. Hello everyone, it's great to be here down in Santa Cruz. Uh, love this drive, I just uh, live right up past Pescadero. So uh, this coastline is, wow, incredible. I'm so, Ah, just blessed every day to live where I live and to do the work that that I'm doing. And I didn't always uh, imagine myself as a as a rancher. Um, I actually really despised ranchers growing up as a uh, a vegetarian raised by hippies. And uh, every summer I went and uh, <coughs> with the packs of wolves in the Frank Church Wilderness of No Return in the middle of Idaho and uh, studied, um, studied the, the pack behavior and uh, watched as they uh, would take down large, large elk and uh, their pups would, would play with the, the shrews and the bulls as uh, little chew toys in the meadows. <laughs> and uh, I remember vividly at one point uh, being very close to a pack and following that path all summer. I was uh, trained as a wildlife tracker, and uh, one of the things that I would do was I would get dropped off uh, before first light and uh, look for the, the fresh tracks of the alpha male that was out at night uh, marking his territory. And uh, I would get set out alone with a, a bottle of water and a radio and uh, follow that that fresh trail to find to find the the, the pack activities. And uh, I remember one day I was tracking alone. And uh, when when you're tracking, uh, something happens. And when you're when, especially when you're alone, and when you're alone in nature, and you're really in your senses, and you're on the edge, and you're. You're tracking this predator in your grizzly country, and 
it, you, you start to feel the tracks come alive, and you actually feel the sensation in your body. And I remember vividly one one time when I was uh, tracking this this alpha, and a moment where I just all of that energy went out of my body, and I nearly just sunk to the ground. And I wasn't quite sure what happened, but I continued following that track. And later on, when I went back to camp, I realized that that wolf had been shot by a rancher. So uh, now I stand here today. I'm, I'm married to a rancher, <laughs> and uh, I am here to talk about the regeneration of, of the world's grasslands. And uh, I went from wildlife tracking into permaculture because I saw permaculture as a solutions-based approach to humans on Earth. <laughs> and uh, up until that point, I was pretty hopeless. Um, I just figured I'd go in the woods and live out my life in a cabin and uh, <laughs> survive on the animals that I hunted. And, the wild foods that I, I foraged on. Uh, and, and then I found permaculture and uh, started to uh, have hope for, for the future. And uh, a little bit about, about my background. Uh, and that man on, on the left there is, uh, or on your right, is Gilbert Walking Bowl. And he's a Lakota that uh, was raised uh, in Wally, South Dakota. That's where he was and he was raised on a refugee camp uh, away from missionary schools. And he didn't learn English until he was in his, uh, in his 20s. So he was very much part of the underground uh, continuing on the ceremonies. And it was, this refugee camp was where all the holy people and the grandmothers fled so that they could continue on following their visions that they were given from the Great Spirit. So he talks about being raised by all these grandmothers and being sent out on uh, long trips in, uh, in South Dakota where, where he grew up. And so he adopted me as his daughter at a young age and he taught me his songs and his ceremonies and, and ways of, of life. And today I, I wanna bring uh, something that I really try to, to live by every day, and that's the seven sacred principles that uh, Gilbert has uh, shared with me. And uh, it really ties into permaculture principles and just basically what, what you all are learning here in this class, to be a full human being that has a place on this planet and is making a difference in your own individual way and having that, that happiness and that life uh, force going through you. So um, nature connection is, is key, right? And, and you all went through that uh, in, the, in the beginning of this course, of uh, connecting with nature, that, that source, and understanding your environment is a principle of uh, holistic management, which I'll talk about. And the first sacred pr principle is Wolwakwaka. And that's sacred silence. That's that silence that you get when you're immersed in your senses and you truly feel like you are a part of nature. And uh, I have an exhibit at the uh, San Francisco Exploratorium and uh, it leads uh, visitors through using your senses to be in nature. And as a, I, I did this exhibit as a wildlife tracker and how I use my senses to detect uh, alarms of predators or to aid in, in wildlife research. And uh, so that's those pictures on the bottom. But the sacred silence is really where it all starts. And, and oftentimes we need to be reminded, you know, when, when life gets busy or our, our minds mess with us and we're thinking too much, just go back to that sacred silence. And uh, it's this predator-prey relationship that I referred to or in that earlier story that uh, I really 
just uh, really sought to understand what is it about these predators, the wildebeest and the lions, or the wolves and the elk, and these grasslands that have so much life to them. And it was about the time that uh, I was learning permaculture that I got introduced to holistic management. And in holistic management, the predator <laughs> relationship is right at the forefront of all of the, the lessons of, hey, we're right here, we're, we're, we're on the edge, we're part of this creation, and how are we going to move towards a life that's regenerating, regenerating ecosystems and a type of agriculture that is building soil. And uh, that's where uh, holistic management really comes into play. And it really starts with, with yourself. And, and uh, I believe Dave put out some, uh, some handouts on your, your readers that you can look towards if you're interested in learning more about, um, more about holistic management. But basically, it, it ties in really well with nature connection and permaculture. The foundation is that nature functions in whole, and to understand your environment. And uh, in my upbringing, uh, I was sort of an, uh, an outcast of uh, the public school system. Uh, uh, I barely made it through middle, middle school, and then by the time I got to high school, I dropped out and figured this is definitely not for me, until finally I found a, a wilderness immersion school. And uh, that pretty much saved my life. And so I was immersed in, in nature, in survival skills, and uh, understanding the environment that I was in, where uh, if I was born to a native family 300 years ago, I would have learned all that in kindergarten. But I learned that as a teenager, and most people on this planet, I could say, die without having that knowledge of actually their life source and where they, what sort of systems are in play for supporting them. So, and then define and really know what you're managing. And uh, if that's your business, if that's your life, if that's your farm, if that's your garden, whatever it is that's really yours, that's your project, really know what it is. And state what you want. Really put it out there, write it down, state what you want. And uh, that's part of holistic management and setting this context. And aim for healthy soil. Soil is, is key. Um, consider all your tools, all your options. Test your decisions and uh, monitor results. So the holistic management framework, basically you're starting by uh, identifying who you're working with, your inventory, uh, your, your assets, your, um, your team, and you're working on your, your mission statement. And that could be personal, that could be for your business, your family, however that is. And then you're setting your holistic goal or your holistic context. And this is what you start with first. You don't start with something external. You really start with what it is that you do you want to see for your quality of life and what do you need in place for that quality of life to really flourish. So you need to set up certain behaviors and systems for that quality of life. And then you always bring it back to the ecosystem process because that's our life source that's supporting us. And uh, it, whether it's the biological community, um, which is this the diversity of species and the way we engage in the succession of whether it be food systems, natural systems, how are we involved? Because humans have always been involved with successions of natural systems. Uh, the water cycle, how do we relate to the water cycle? How does our holistic context relate to the water cycle? Um, the mineral cycle, uh, that transfer of nutrients 
between uh, plant roots and essentially into our bodies and those microbes that are in the soils that eventually end up in, in our gut. And then the energy flow, how everything is connected through photosynthesis, through solar power, and cycles through this ecosystem process. And then you look at all of your tools. So if it's a farm, if it's a garden, you're looking at, you're analyzing all of these tools for your, uh, that goes back to your holistic context. And you're planning and you're monitoring and you're revising everything as you go and continuing to lead everything towards the context that you created for your quality of life. So um, this is a good one. If you, know, if, if you have a piece of paper in front of you, um, if, and draw a circle, or it's probably not going to be a circle. <laughs> but if you're all the way towards the middle of that, that's sort of like you're the, the least on that, uh, uh, you know, say health, for example. If you feel like your health is really struggling, you're going to start your, your pen right at the center of that wheel. But if you feel like your spirituality and mental health is just thriving, like I could not be any higher right now to, uh, to spirit, then you're going to be way to the outside. And your, your contribution to the environment, how is that? Are you really, do you really feel like you're contributing to the environment, to sort of the crises that we're facing? Or do you kind of feel like you're just kind of floating along? Um, your relationships. How are your relationships in life? How's your financial stability? How's your community? Your relationship to your community? Is you, are you providing what your community needs? And is your community providing what you need? Uh, your personal goals. How, how are you on that, that side of the wheel? And your family. How's your family? You know, is, how's your relationship? family and with that, that central fire that, uh, you know, where, where you came from. And most of us, you know, we'll have a wheel that, you know, barely rolls, right, and <laughs> probably falls over. But over time, we're working to, to spread that out, that wheel out, so that eventually we can work on all of these aspects of our lives. And uh, this is what, you know, I, I studied holistic management in college um, about 10 years ago, and uh, I'm just now revisiting every step of the process in the next two years. And uh, I have a mentor that I talk to weekly about this, and I'm applying it directly after 10 years of uh, owning and operating an agriculture business with my family. and. Uh, setting out to uh, be able to actually support a family in the Bay Area off of the land and the income that we get directly from the land. It's, it's a bit of a challenge, but uh, we've been able to do it. We've made a lot of mistakes. And uh, as, a, as a ranching family that really wants to, wants our children to have the ability to uh, be on the land and go out and <coughs> make a bow or go out and gather wild plants and run free and be feral. Uh, this was the life that we chose, that we could actually make a living on the land, be outside, raise our children with those values of caring for the earth. So this is what we created as our family. We created our mission statement and we created our vision statement to steward grassland. So we do. We feed thousands of families in the Bay Area. We, uh, we run cattle like sheep and, and then to keep the whole fire burning, strong family values of love for each other, roughly 8,000 acres. To make a big impact for the future generations by influencing large scale so restoration of watersheds and the grass vegetarian in them. Raise a lot of big parents to uh, you know feeding thousands of families. It's 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 been a shift, but it's been a great journey. So the second uh, sacred principle is uh, uh compassion. 
And it's really the permaculture principle of care for the people. When we have compassion for those that are around us, for and the, our families, for the children, for those that are sick, those that need our help, then we feel, we can feel closer to being fulfilled. And keeping, also keeping that home fire burning. And the third is Wowa uh, Mushima. And that's a deep caring for all creation. So this is care of the earth for all systems to flourish and multiply. So once we have this Wowa the sacred silence, and we have a deep understanding of creation, we have a deep caring for creation, and we are aiming for healthy soils in everything we do, then we can really start to put it into practice. And that's, you know, that's our home ranch right there, which is just up the coast, uh, north of Pescadero. And uh, it's, it's a grassland. That grassland was once home to large herds of elk, large herds of antelope, and in the Pleistocene, you know, mammoths and camels and horses and, and you name it. So these grasslands evolved with large grazing animals in this predator-prey relationship. And what we're doing through biomimicry is working to bring that back through our agricultural systems. And grasslands cover 45% of the world's land mass. So that's a pretty, you know, a pretty big area, and it's an important area to, to work in. And we all need to eat. And wouldn't I love if we could, you know, go back to eating a native diet? I'm sure we'd all be healthier. However, it's just not practical right now. And uh, cattle can do a pretty darn good job of mimicking those, uh, those native grazers. And the wildlife, the biodiversity, is abundant on these grasslands. So these are just a few pictures that you know, were taken recently. Uh, grasshoppers, sparrow, ground nests that I just came across a couple days ago while I was fixing hot wire. Uh, mountain lion kitten uh, that got treed down the road. Uh, burrowing owl burrow, mountain lion tracks, a long-tailed weasel, and these are the kinds of uh, species that we're helping to preserve their habitat, their home, through the practices of rangeland stewardship. And then the next principle is Wolwa uh, Wolpie. And that's really where you put all of this energy and this love for the earth, and this deep caring, and you put it into practice. You know, unfortunately, a lot of people, once they realize that they're connected and they realize that they have this deep caring for all of creation, a lot of times they just get stuck there <laughs> and don't really know where to go with it. So that's when you really need to figure out, okay, well, where are you going to go with it? Put it into action and state what you want in your holistic context. Write it down and fair share. Set limits and redistribute redistrib surplus. And uh, for us, putting it into action is those agricultural productive regenerative, regenerative systems that end up creating this nutrient-dense food because our soils are really working the way they should be working. That's the long term. And what does holistically managed land look like versus conventionally managed land? There's more roots, which store more carbon, and uh, there's less, which means less carbon in the atmosphere. And then conventionally managed land, there you'll see a lot of bare soil, and the water cycles aren't as effective, so holistically managed land, you're working on the mineral cycle, the water cycle, the succession, the biodiversity, the energy flow of photosynthesis. There's a lot of ways you can go with this. And here's a ranch that we have uh, up in Sonoma County. And uh, you can see that uh, fence line right there is holistically managed land on the ranch that we manage with our cattle on the left and conventionally managed land on the right, right? They're both, both using cattle, right? Cattle on both sides of the fence. It's not some, you know, some different species or some different, you know, magical thing that happens. It's basically just mimicking 
how native grazers graze these grasslands. And that there is a very healthy stand of our state grass, purple needlegrass. And uh, it's there, it's in the seed bank. And when we start to learn these management systems of bringing the herd close in as a predator would, bunching them together, and then moving them on and allowing those grasslands to rest and recover before you bring that herd back. Amazing, you get amazing results. Your animals are healthier, your grasslands are healthier, you're gonna retain more soil, you're gonna sequester carbon. And this, you know, this should be happening on all of the world's grasslands. Wouldn't that be amazing? Wouldn't that be amazing? these types of management could be happening on that 45% of our land mass. Yeah. So um, a nation that destroys its soil destroys itself. <laughs> and that's something that you know, we all need to remember. The choices that we make every day, the food that we eat, the way that we, uh, we live, are we building soil or are we depleting soil? <laughs> and the problem is the solution. Uh, so many... Uh, environmental groups and uh, you know I was just telling Artie of this open space uh, that land trust that we leased from uh, 12 years ago they were kicking all the cattle off the land and now they're realizing that they made a mistake because di biodiversity plummeted when the cattle were kicked off the land the uh, grasses and the forages and the invasive species came in and became stagnant and oxidized to, uh, in, with the result of carbon being released into the atmosphere, bare soil, because there wasn't that biological activity that these animals bring when you manage them on these grasslands. So now, they're bringing the cattle back. And uh, this, is a, this is a good chart right here for those of you who are interested in uh, our solution to the climate crisis. And as you can imagine, there's been a lot of studies, and this one compares sort of uh, what, how much atmospheric carbon can be sequestered, uh, basically that line through the middle is how, how much atmospheric carbon, and then um, the, the lines uh, going up and down are what the, uh, what, what the cost is compared to the technique. So right there in the middle, sort of the happy medium, uh, you're gonna get the most bang for your buck. <laughs> sort of, you know, you're not at, okay, I'm gonna um, change out a light bulb, or I'm gonna um, get, a, get a hybrid car. Uh, you know, those are sort of low cost, no brainers. Yeah, that's, that's easy to do, but it's, uh, stores very little atmospheric carbon, and then all the way to the super expensive, you know, retrofit your, um, your gas plants and all of that, uh, go right in the middle of reduce slash and burn agriculture conversion, reduce pasture land conversion, grassland management, organic soils restoration. That's sort of right where everyone can be working, every common, person that has a garden that eats, we can all be working right in that happy medium of storing the most atmospheric carbon with all of the tools that we have right at hand. So, and work with nature. This was, uh, this photo was taken, uh, I guess it would be a, a, just over a year ago. Uh, third year of a drought where we were grazing stockpile forage uh, that uh, just to basically just to stay in business and there isn't a lot of nutrition in that forage so uh, our animals uh, they made it through the drought uh, however you know, we had to make sure that the mineral balance was really good and but you can see bringing them into that area that hadn't been grazed in years uh, and all of this dry matter was oxidizing and dying off. And then what happens after they leave that area? What do you see? They'll graze some of it, right? And then the rest of it, they trample. And it creates this incredible mat 
of mulch on the layer of uh, 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 the layer on the soil surface, and that organic matter is what's building soil, and they're urinating and they're pooping, and all of this is, is fertilizing and regenerating that that land, and that that uh, patch of ground. I, I, I was just there moving cattle on the way down. It's right on Cloakdale Road. Um, that patch of ground looks amazing right now. It's just coming up with incredible clover and vetch and uh, native bunch grasses, California oak grass, and all of this amazing species. And uh, prior to grazing it, it was predominantly invasive, such as uh, Italian thistle and hardy grass. And now that the cattle are coming in, just that simple tool of animal impact, you're starting to see that balance coming into play. So consider all tools and make the least change for the greatest, uh, greatest possible effect. And that's kind of what, that's what our days look like. You know, we're managing herds anywhere from 50 to 200 head of cattle. And uh, we've got hot wire fencing that they're behind. And uh, that's just a simple, low-tech tool of herd, herd density, herd effect, and um, stock density. So you have the herd coming through, and you bunch them up, and you use the hot wire like a predator would, keep them bunched up. And then you open it, and then they move into a fresh, uh, fresh pasture and uh, they're able to gain more because they sort of had that competitiveness when you know it's like you gotta take a bite before your neighbor takes a bite and uh, they end up being uh, healthier animals and we raised this uh, heritage breed of belted galloway cattle and uh, these cattle are, are originate from scotland and uh, these coastal hills that we graze are a lot like climate in scotland so we've uh, developed genetics that are really well suited for, uh, for our climate. And here's a ranch that uh, we just started on in, in October, the Jenner Headlands. And it's a 5,600 acre preserve uh, in Sonoma County, the mouth of the Russian River. And uh, yeah, it's, it's incredible. And uh, we were really fortunate to be awarded the lease because as you can imagine, ranches like this is really competitive, right? People want to get out there. You know, people even, you imagine the, the kind of people in this area that would just pay a lease just so they could ride their horse on a ranch like that. So, um, but our family fit exactly what this conservation organization was looking for. Um, a ranching family that's grass fed, because what they're working towards in these grasslands is that carbon sequestration, that biodiversity. And the minute that those animals leave that land and are sold off to Harris Ranch or are sold off to a feedlot, you might as well just flush all that work down the toilet, right? So they wanted animals to be able to go right from there, right to the end, end user. Uh, without all of that inhumane treatment uh, in between. And uh, this is the first conservation group in all of California that has actually stated that that's what they want. There's a lot of land, I think 40 million acres of cattle land in California, and there's one conservation group. And there's a, there's a lot of land trusts and a lot of public lands in California, and only one that has stated that they do not want the animals that are raised on their land to end up in a feedlot. So you know we've got a long ways to go in the environmental and the conservation movement because they, a lot of these conservation groups, they look at cat as a tool and a tool only. And uh, they are in uh, permaculture, terms, they would be sort of, a, in, the, in conservation, they would be a proven species for uh, land, land management because they, they, especially in these coastal grasslands, 
they have proven themselves to uh, sequester more carbon, to uh, create that biodiversity, to increase the percentage of native perennial bunch grasses through properly managed cattle grazing. So there's a big movement to bring cattle back on this land, but no one's necessarily thinking of the whole picture. And that's really what we're working towards, is this type of agriculture that you're looking from, you know, seed to plate, from birth to the table, to the entire life cycle of your food. And the next sacred uh, principle is wobbly uh, hesha, and that's being, you know, being fully alive. That's when you've realized that vision, that context that you have created for yourself, and you have put into practice that work that you have come to from that deep caring for all of life's creation. And you just have that moment, like you jump out of a, you know, you jump into a cold stream and that feeling when you get out, ah, I'm fully alive. So this is us moving our herd on the, the Jenner headlands. This is just when we started uh, um, coming onto this ranch. And you can see our ranch hand right in the back. Uh, and you know, after she had hiked the cattle all the way up from the coast, all the way up this hill to another pasture, you know, just walking with them up this hill, like she just had this look on her face, like, ah, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. You know, she had that wobbly hecha moment of, yes, this, this is it. <laughs> so, and then whenever you're working in agriculture systems in nature, you're going to test your decisions and you're going to monitor results. When we first came onto this ranch, the Jenner Headlands, we were freaked out because it had been managed conventionally for 38 years and uh, by a rancher, a sweet old man, that uh, basically just didn't want to change. Anybody know him? <laughs> familiar with us? Um, and so it, it didn't really work with this really progressive uh, land conservation group. And basically his cattle had grazed every single plant species pretty much to the dirt so that it was like a billiard table. But there was only one grass that they didn't graze. So, and it was this grass here that you see bent over and dead and dying that uh, is sort of like this old growth, uh, non-native uh, bunch grass from, from Argentina that sort of took over these grasslands. And his cattle never touched it. And so we were pretty freaked out because that was the only thing left when we brought our cattle in, in uh, this last October. And we had already experienced over three years of a drought. We were going into our fourth year of drought. We were worried about the animal's nutrition. We were taking sample forage samples, seeing if there was something toxic with this plant. And it was incredible. Our cattle went straight for this plant. They ate it, they trampled it into the ground. And those, this lower picture is what that field looked like after our herd came through. So 38 years of that land being managed by a conventional cattle rancher, every single species was grazed to nothing except this invasive species. Our cattle came in, they trampled that into the ground, they trampled it into the soil, we moved them on. Now the, uh, we're going out there and the researchers and the uh, land stewards out there are just, you know, they call me up just and say, oh my God, I have never seen this ranch look as good as it does. And we've only been there for, what, six months? Now there's all of this incredible native forbs coming up, native bunch grasses everywhere. Just the simple tool of changing management practices. And you want to integrate rather than segregate. So we do a lot of, you know, working with people and you know, it'd be nice to say that, you know, we can just you know, get on our horse and, and go out on the range and fix the fence and move some cattle and then be done with the day. 
But ranching in the Greater Bay Area with landowners that uh, you know, hopefully you share enough common goals with. There's a lot of education, and a lot of our job is in uh, integrating with these landowners, integrating with the community, integrating with our customer base, and you know, standing around the field and doing a lot of this, just talking, talking shop, and talking water and grass and, and everything else. So, speaking of water, <laughs> that's been a big, uh, a big subject with uh, going into the fourth year drought, and you know, not sure where where we're going to go from here. And uh, California being such a huge uh, contributor to uh, the U.S. produce, uh, where, where where are we going with with our water, and how are we gonna how are we gonna make it work? So we work a lot with the Resource Conservation District and the Natural Resource Conservation Service to the point where we have uh, raised close to a million dollars in grant funds towards uh, <coughs> projects such as this, of catchment ponds and uh, storage and infrastructure on some of these degraded rangelands to help us manage these ecosystems in a way that will regenerate the soils and the grasslands. So uh, this, this pond right here, um, it's actually featured in, a, in an all-girls skateboard video. Yeah. I don't know if any of you have seen it. Um, uh, a, a good friend of ours, uh, Tiffany, did this oh, yeah. one with the uh, uh, element. And, and it shows my husband uh, taking off on a jump and landing his dirt bike right in the pond. And uh, <laughs> probably not the best thing for, uh, you know, for, for the current landowner right now to see, you know, see him riding his dirt bike into the pond with a, a blow-up Barbie doll strapped to his back. <laughs> um, but that pond wasn't there before my husband uh, got this ring. So he got this ranch, and uh, it was pretty much one big pasture uh, being managed conventionally. And someone that was in his, you know, well, he's, he got this ranch when he was 18. And someone, at, you know, at 18 years old, early 20s, with imagine all of the heavy equipment that you could imagine at your disposal, <laughs> and a blank checkbook to, you know, to to create. So what he did was he went out. And he built stock ponds. He built about 15 of these stock ponds, just in areas that made sense, that gathered water, and uh, you know made sense to to collect water, because the cattle were all sort of going to these central water areas and overgrazing areas. So he said, "All right, let's spread them out and, and let's build ponds." So let's me keep all of it. <laughs> And uh, now this pond right here is, you know, one of the best uh, red-legged frog ponds in the entire San Mateo County. I mean, this time of year, you can barely walk three steps without, uh, you know, having a red-legged frog jump out of the track of a, of a cow. So, uh, you know, that's something that wasn't there prior to him uh, building this pond. And, already mentioned uh, Darren Doherty, who's uh, a permaculturist from Australia, and he really brings an incredible concept of uh, key line design that uh, he brings from, uh, from Australia, a technique to infiltrate water, and not only that, but carbon farming, and how can we take these skills into the next generation uh, and create systems that will feed the people without destroying the earth. So key lime plow, we use some of this. We haven't been able to use much of it in the drought because it just hasn't been wet enough. Um, and that's what it looks like. You know, you go across um, a field, slightly off contour, and you capture that uh, water, the rainfall or uh, the, the overland flow, and you spread it out uh, through your pastures, and the water infiltrates into the roots, and you're able to grow more grass, sequester more carbon, 
Any guesses what that is? It's a hoof print. So uh, that each of those little micro landscapes of a hoof print also captures water and infiltrates that water into the soil. So you know we'll see amazing uh, results of areas where the cattle have been when the soil is slightly moist and they just leave these little divots in the ground and then a rain event comes. Uh, one particular, like this last December, uh, when we had that 10 inches in two days, uh, we did not have runoff. All of that water just infiltrated like a sponge. And uh, that's, it's amazing the lasting results from that December rains that you can have when you actually create um, effective rainfall. So going back to, to soils, uh, the world's cultivative soils have lost 50 to 70 percent of their carbon stock. So soil and carbon go hand in hand. Soil is originally a huge store of carbon and can continue to store carbon. And grasslands hold 20% of the world's carbon stock. And if we can increase the soil organic matter by 1%, that's not only storing billions of tons of carbon annually, but it's also storing water. A 1% increase on one acre of land, of organic matter, can store 16,500 gallons of water. I mean, that, that's huge, and that's what, you know, folks are really, in the scientific community, are really starting to realize. It's these agriculture practices that build soil and that are able to sequester carbon, hold more water, reduce the extremes of flood and drought and create a more effective water cycle. The USDA is really, really starting to realize this potential. And uh, that basically that's where we need, to, we need to be working. We need to be working in no-till agriculture, perennial agriculture systems. Let's redefine the way we eat and the way we grow food. And speaking of food, we also raise pigs, um, out in the brush, and these are heritage hogs, uh, Berkshires and, and red wattles. And they do amazing things with, with rooting in the ground and uh, creating uh, their own little ecosystem. But they definitely have to be controlled. Can't really see that side, but we raise, uh, we raise chickens, we raise Freedom Ranger chickens out on pasture. And this is something that our ranch hand has, has really taken on because uh, she, she started working with us and uh, you know, came, came to work with us and said, okay, in three years, I want to move back home to North Carolina and buy a farm and pay off the farm with, with farming. And you know, li living in California, you think, yeah, right, like you could buy a piece of land and pay it off with agriculture. But there's still places you know, in the country that you can actually do that. So she has set out to do it, and she's building her farm enterprise. This year, she's raising 1,000 uh, chickens for meat. And uh, she figured out how she can save up 
a down payment on a farm back home and work with the farm service agency to get a beginning farmer rancher loan and actually be able to buy a piece of land, start her farm out there and uh, pay it off through through agriculture. And that's, that's just amazing. It's those kinds of stories that really give us hope. Like, oh my gosh, I can work for myself the rest of my life and just be a farmer and be out there and own my own piece of land and have a little house and look out at my cattle and my chickens. And it's like, you gotta start somewhere, right? And we've really built it from the ground up. Um, you know, we do not have private investors. We started with a small herd of cattle and uh, we grew from there and uh, every year took on a little bit more land. This last year we doubled our acreage in response to the drought, even though our production stayed the same. And you know, we just, just make it work and it really all comes down to really setting out and stating what you want with your life making sure that it's aligned with your lifestyle choices, your holistic context, stating what you want, good planning, and that includes financial planning, and uh, monitoring and creating this life that you want for yourself. So we also do multi-species grazing. This is sheep and cattle grazing in one pen. Uh, we have a small, uh, a small dairy. I milk three, three Jersey cows, and uh, average of you know 12 gallons a day of milk. So that's more than a family, <laughs> a family can drink. So we have a herd share uh, where we have about 30 families that co-own the the milk cows, and that's our milking parlor right there. They come in and uh, get milk one at a time, and then the milk goes right. Right from the cow, straight to straight to a jar. It's raw. It's the best thing on earth. It is so good. And speaking of so good, it's, here's a chart here comparing raw milk um, with with this milk because I made the commitment when I started having babies that they would be raised with local, organic, grass-fed meats, milk, vegetables all within a close range to our farm if it's not grown on our farm. And milk was the big, the big one. <laughs> so I wanted my babies to go right from breast milk, right to raw cow's milk because it is so similar and it's one of those nutrient dense foods that you can live off of. And uh, it's, it just has so many of those essential minerals and nutrients and that you know people kill when they heat it up. You kill all of that good stuff. And uh, guess where this led me? <laughs> Wanting to raise my family on raw milk straight from our farm led me to the capital. <laughs> and uh, we were a part of a movement in California to shut down small family farms that were sharing, uh, sharing raw milk with, with neighbors. And uh, several farms received cease and desist orders. I wouldn't let them through our locked gate to come and see, even though I had a CDFA inspector walk a mile in from the highway, walk up to my, one of my milk cows, grab a test tube, and milk her out and steal a sample of milk from my cow to take it back to test it in the state lab. This is just criminal, <coughs> what they were doing to small family farms. And I had to get off the farm and take a stand for this. And I was able to gather hundreds and hundreds of supporters, um, draft legislation, uh, work with the Secretary of Agriculture, Karen Ross, to create a stakeholder group in Sacramento and bring in all of the big agribusinesses and all of the heavy hitters at the Capitol, including Farm Bureau, Western United Dairymen, and you know, all of these, you know, these constituent groups that have their own lobbyists. And brought them all to the table and said, hey, what are we gonna do about this? This is a, 
a multi-generational tradition of feeding your kids raw milk from your farm and sharing it with your neighbors, and you saw those charts, I mean, it's the healthiest thing you could give a growing child. And uh, I called it my grandmother's bill because that's how my grandmother bought her, her how my great-grandparents bought their homestead in Montana, was by selling raw milk to the nearby Missoula. And uh, they also had honey and you know, a, a whole host of a diverse um, farm products that you can only imagine of you know, a, a homestead a uh, hundred years ago. So common sense practices that are now illegal, why aren't there more homesteads? Why aren't there more family farms producing their own food and selling it directly to their neighbors and their consumers? Because it's illegal. And you try to do it, and you run up against this big corporate machine. And we saw it right here in the Capitol. We gathered over 100 family farms, farmers from across the state in support of this bill. And we all stood up in our support, and we had seven white men in gray suits stand up against this bill. And it didn't get past the um, Agriculture Committee of the Assembly because it was shot down by agribusiness. And it was a simple, simple bill that would legitimize a very small scale, we're talking three cows. <laughs> For me to be allowed to have three cows on my farm to feed my family and a few other families. It's illegal. And uh, we made enough waves at the Capitol. We got invited back by some um, of our legislators. And now there's sort of a ceasefire that, okay, you don't mess with us, we won't mess with you. It's still not legal, but at least they're not going after us. So that was one of the most emotional times in my life where I realized that we are up against some big challenges because we're rethinking the way we do things. And the last 100 years of the industrial agriculture movement has really hurt us big time. And it hasn't just hurt our soils, but it has hurt our bodies, it has hurt our relationships, and we are in the process of rebuilding that. And it's up to all of us to figure out ways of rebuilding that. And when you go out and do it, you're gonna run into barriers like this. So, um, just a few last principles. What is it that we're leaving for the next generation, seven generations into the future? And you know, for me, it's my you know my four-year-old daughter. Just after we you know moved a herd of 300 cows into a fresh new pasture, and you know she just looks up at me in bliss and says, "Mommy, I want to be a rancher when I grow up." Just you know that woe you she, the joy of a child. Of, you know, let's let's get back into that joy and remember those moments when you were a child. You learned how to ride a bike, or uh, you know, you had those moments of play, and uh, bring that back into your life. And then Wozani is where it all comes together. It's that connection of mind, body, and spirit. And uh, my eight-year-old son, this was his first bow. He just finished making uh, his first longbow, and uh, he embodies this Wozani because he wakes up in the morning. And it's He's outside and he's got his uh, machete and, or his hatchet and he's chopping firewood and he's out building bows and he's doing what a kid should be doing and he's completely immersed in his body and his mind and his spirit. And it's also what these Bushman trackers that uh, this, this Afrikaans man, Louis Liebenberg, um, worked with these uh, worked with these Bushman trackers, and they were able to gather more science in seven days in their area of the Kalahari than Western science had in seven years, because of that deep connection to place, and that's sort of what we need to look at. Like these these guys are a dying dying race, 
and that lineage is, is fairly holding on. So I just want to thank all of you for, for your work that you're doing, for being a part of this class. And uh, if you want to get a hold of me, have any questions, that's who I am. And uh, thank you, thank you very much. Um, I'm not sure, we just saw a beautiful, beautiful model of what it's supposed to be like when you raise livestock on land. Um, I'm not sure if here everybody understands where most um, meat comes from and how it's raised. So let me just give a little background on what's called CAFOs, Concentrated Animal Feeding Operations. And these are places that you smell before you can see, if you drive in Central Valley. Um, there are thousands and thousands of cattle packed into um, basically Feed, feed lots with cement bottoms, they're living in their own waste, um, disease is prevalent, antibiotic use is, is uh, overused, um, and, and it's an ecological disaster. Right? So that's what we're comparing this to. And so in terms of um, how I understood where this kind of holistic management comes from was, um, you know, the, Midwest, the Great Plains, um, that's some of the most fertile soil in the world, right? And, and why is it that way? Because there were millions and millions of bison grazing. They would, they would stop, start to graze on, on, the, gra on the native grasses. They would fertilize with their, with their uh, manure. They would uh, also fertilize with their urine, high nitrogen. Those were chemical signals to predators to come and say, okay, it's the wolves come and they start to pick out the wheat, the old of, um, of that herd, and that moved the herd along, right? So it didn't overgraze the grass, right? So, so the bison depended on the grass, right? The the predators are dependent on the bison. The grass is dependent on the predator. So, can you talk a little bit, Donica, about um, how you mimic that? You, you touched on it, but I want to sort of explain a little bit more in terms of how that actually works. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, just, just so everyone knows, our cattle are never fed corn. <laughs> they are never stand in a feedlot. And uh, I would argue that, you know, the, the most water-loving, uh, crop corn in our nation uh, should not be fed to animals. And let's just stop that right now. Let's just get all the feedlots wiped out of this country, get the animals back on the pasture, and really start to do the work. Boycott feedlot altogether. Just, just boycott it. Uh, and so that, that predator-prey relationship, which I referred to, we do that simply with um, infrastructure. So uh, we set up these uh, fences, and we set up watering areas, and we move the cattle timed with the growth of the forages and the seasons. So it's... Uh, Part of our planning process is the grazing planning. And uh, we bunch the herds together. So for instance, uh, our ranches range from, you know, one is 1,000 acres, another one is you know, 5,000 acres. So depending on the size of the herd, uh, our pastures are anywhere from, you know, 300 feet by 100 feet to 40 acres. And uh, we move those herds through the pastures with portable electric fencing, permanent fencing, uh, moving the water, and then allowing that uh, field that they had just grazed to fully recover before those animals come back. So that tool of rest is often a tool that is uh, not, you know, doesn't be given enough attention. So people are concerned with, 
when the, when the actual plants are in the ground, the animals are grazing. But what about that time that the ground needs to rest and recover? And uh, in farming, that might be when you plant a cover crop or um, you know, something, some other type of, of rotation so that that land can, can recover before you put it under, under stress again. And then when we bring in anim animals into a pasture, um, we want to make sure that energy flow is continuing. So um, say the feed is this high, the grasses and, and the forbs, we don't graze it to here, <laughs> right? We graze it to here so that there's enough leaf that the photosynthesis will uh, continue to come into play and those grasses are gonna recover quicker, therefore having more forage for our animals, more uh, uh, feed for, for wildlife and uh, the soil continues to be shaded. So the other benefit of that is when the, the cattle are feeding the top grass, there's a root die off, right? And that root die off is a carbon source then for the microbiology in the soil, right? So as so, so the the actual grazing is stimulating the, the soil food web under the under the soil. Yeah, right? absolutely. Um, so the, let's go back again to this predator prey relationship. And um, you, like many ranchers, um, have uh, loss due to mountains, right? Uh, a lot of ranchers are out there with a shotgun. How do you, what's your um, perspective on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I love mountain lions. My husband loves mountain lions. That's actually how we met, was uh, he caught my friend trespassing because she was tracking a mountain lion and told him that her friend had pictures of the mountain lions in the watershed, and that was, that was me. I used to set up cameras and get pictures um, of the cats. That was the work that I was doing when I first came to California. So uh, we, we monitor where our cattle are and uh, we try to avoid predator-prey uh, conflict. And uh, we also just account for a certain percentage of loss. You know, they, they were here first and um, I think actually if we, if humans had a predator, then we would probably be much better off probably be more aware <laughs> and in our senses and in the moment and I think we would have those fully alive moments more often so you know I, I don't think it'd be such a bad thing if, uh, <laughs> if there were more mountain lions. So you talked a bit about um, in your permaculture principles and your holistic management about observation right so can you give us some example I mean first of all how is that, how do you build that skill in someone? How do you teach that? And then, um, you know, what's your experience with it? And how has it worked for you as a tool in your post Yeah. Yeah, so sort of observation is the key to everything. <laughs> and uh, learning how to observe the seasons, uh, observe the patterns in nature. And, uh, you know, I think I really learned it uh, as, as a tracker. And I, I think that's sort of what, what I can bring to, to ranching is that deep observation training that I had for, you know, since my early, uh, early teenage years of full immersion into tracking. And I remember, you know, I, I studied with the, um, Tom Brown Jr. over on the East Coast. And I, I remember at one point, uh, sitting, sitting with him and trying to figure out how he can detect these subtle tracks on the ground. And, uh, you know, some, something uh, he said had really stuck with me because, you know, we were looking out across the, this edge of a road and uh, he said, you know, you see that, see that pattern? And see right there, you know, this was, he hadn't gone over to the area that he was pointing. You see right there, there's a gray fox track, and that gray fox track is going this way. I'm thinking, there's, how can you see a gray fox track, you know, 50 feet away? And uh, sure enough, I walk over, and there's a gray fox track right there. And I had walked with him from his car to this spot that he had never been to. And uh, he's seeing a gray fox track that he can't physically see. And what he said was, it's a break in the pattern. So
So in permaculture, we learn about patterns, right? So when we're going through and we're learning patterns and we're noticing patterns out in nature or out in our rangeland or out in our garden or farm or um, wherever it is that we are, the challenge is when do you see a break in the pattern? And that's sort of the key to, to observation. It's like one thing to see a pattern, but when do you see that that pattern is broken? And that's where you go to really figure out what's going on is on those edges. So I mentioned um, Janine Benyus uh, and Biomimicry. And uh, at the Bioneers Conference one time, Jean, Janine said, um, I love limits. And she said, that's where the elegance of design comes in. That's where, the, where you have to um, uh, use your creativity in design. So I saw twice in your presentation limits. One was your holistic wheel. It's the, and it had in the corner there limiting factors. And then um, another place, putting into action, set limits. So um, how do you use limits to your advantage? And, how do you work with that? Yeah, I think you know we're trained to be uh, very um, consumer driven, <laughs> and uh, just sort of take, 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 take. And uh, for for us, it's like we're we're constantly setting limits at, at, every day and uh, looking to uh, regenerate more than than we take. Leave leave more than we, than we take. So, um, and also just finding, finding those, those limitations. Um, so whether it be things that, uh, that we're lacking in our business or in our life and focusing on why that is and where we can, can build that. So, um, you know, that wheel exercise in, in holistic management, we look at, you know, we imagine a chain, and we look at the weakest link in that, that chain. You know, if it's a chain in your, your production, if it's a chain in your uh, resource conversion, and what is that weak, weakest link, and you, you focus on, on that, and uh, put your energy towards that. And um, so, Joe Salem talks about uh, participatory environmentalism and, and, and abandonment environmentalism. And, and so I'm trying to make a connection here with this issue of disturbance. And you, you showed a really great example of when the hoof print captured the water and held the water. So can you, um, are there other examples of how disturbance, of how interaction with the environment is actually a stimulant and, a, and, a, and conserves? Yeah, I think just the very act of us being alive is, is causing disturbance. We cause disturbance when we walk through the forest, when we stir up um, you know, uh, insects, and then the birds come in and feed on those insects. Uh, you know, we're, we're constantly causing disturbance. So how do we create it so that that disturbance is at the right place at the right time? And that's really the key to large-scale grassland management in the way that we do it is figuring out how to get those herds to the right place at the right time. And it's a learning process. You know, we do, it's, it's something that uh, you, you learn over time. And, and the thing is, is like, there's always another season. <laughs> you know, we, we, we don't cause so much disturbance that that land won't recover or that, that ant, those animals won't recover. We cause enough so that it'll make an impact and we can observe how that disturbance affected the whole and then we can build upon that. So like one of the disturbances that I can uh, point out is uh, this idea of you know, these, these invasive species of uh, you know, the, the, the conservation organizations we work with, uh, typically their uh, immediate reaction to uh, an invasive species is spray with Roundup. And you'd be amazed at how much Roundup is used on these land trusts, public lands, conservation lands, all of these environmental groups that 
raise a lot of money um, to buy up these lands are applying thousands, thousands, millions of gallons of this herbicide that is essentially killing the soil. So um, a way that you know we can sort of say, okay, well, you guys have this war against invasive species. For us, it's kind of like, well, it's just a symbol that the land is out of balance and we can work to bring it more in balance. So uh, what we'll do is we'll bring our animals in when those particular species that these land trusts have a war against, um, we'll bring them in right when they're in their real tender stage. And we'll get the animals in there and they'll trample them and, and eat some of them and, and then we'll move them on. And then the next phase, maybe the, um, the clovers will come in and it'll allow room for other species to come in. So that type of disturbance, and you can see it on some of these land trust lands, is uh, you know, we're bringing in cattle to, to bring these lands back in balance. And you know, right across the road is uh, land owned by State Park that they kick the cattle off and it's just massive erosion, completely overgrown monoculture of these invasive species and all of this other slew of uh, land issues when you take the land stewards and the cattle off of it. And then you see on the other side of the fence these dead zones where these conservation groups have sprayed Roundup repeatedly over and over and over and killed the soil so much that nothing will grow. And uh, it's a constant challenge that, that we deal with. And we're always looking at, okay, what, what is all of this embodied energy that we're putting into our practices? And it's not just about one aspect of it. It's not just about you know, the, the carbon sequestration. Yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna bring cattle in and they're gonna eat these grasses and then that, that, that die off of the roots is gonna occur. And, and grasslands have an incredible ability at sequestering carbon because of their rate of growth and die back, growth and die back. It's constant, it's a like constant carbon pump. But we're not just looking at that. We're looking at the whole picture. You know, we're not gonna you know, run cattle and then spray ramp up and you know, we, we're testing these different decisions. We're not gonna just bring some guy's cattle in and then you know, not care about the health of those animals and force them to eat something that they wouldn't want to eat um, because we need to look at that, that whole picture and we need to look at the water and the minerals and photosynthesis and the entire life cycle. So obviously the drought is affecting us all in a big way. Um, agriculture is really being hit hard. Hundreds of thousands of acres in the Central Valley are not being farmed the last few years because of the drought. So how is the drought impacting you and, and what is it teaching you? Yeah, I mean, if you're, if you're a farmer and a rancher and you don't plan for drought, then you're just stupid. I mean, you just, <laughs> you just have to plan for the extremes. You have to. And uh, that's a big part of the holistic management planning process, is you plan for drought. You uh, do your, your, your planning, and you make sure you leave enough forage for an extended drought. So we plan for it, and most ranchers in California didn't plan for it, and they sold their cattle, they grazed their ground all the way to dirt, and then sold the cattle off and they may never get back into ranching. There's a lot of ranchers that went out of business in the last few years. Um, what we did is we kind of just, you know, we didn't expand our herd size, and we did a lot of planning, figured out, you know, which water sources were gonna be uh, secure and weren't gonna dry up, and then we went and got additional rangeland. So we we're running the same amount of animals with uh, more land. And you know, the, the whole, California agriculture, there's there's so much to be done. I mean, we have along with the coast here, we've got our nice little farms, and yeah, we've got some monoculture grow crops here and there, Brussels sprouts that are grown conventionally, and, 
and whatnot. But you know, you go into the Central Valley and um, you see, you know, alfalfa, for example, is is the biggest water using crop in in California. Does anybody know what where that alfalfa is going? It's going to China. It's being compressed where a bale like this is being compressed into these little blocks and it's being put on a barge and backhauled after China brings all its crap here. The alfalfa is being backhauled to China to feed their dairy cows and their CAFOs because Chinese politicians want every single uh, person to be able to have a serving of milk a day. And so we are exporting California's water to China in the form of alfalfa. Is that smart? Is that resiliency in a drought? And ranchers have been knowing about this for years and years, and this is just starting to come to public attention. Just recently, it was, it was in National Geographic all of the water that is being shipped to China in the form of alfalfa. And alfalfa is good. I mean, it's like, for an animal, you know, corn is kind of like the crack cocaine because it tastes so good, but it's so bad, right? It's so bad for you, and it eats up your stomach, and it, you know, it causes ulcers, but alfalfa, it's like the super food. You know, it's, it's good. It also has all of those minerals and uh, nutrients in it. It's just, it's an amazing crop. And uh, last year I was doing a long haul through the valley and I was, you know, as far as the eye could see, I saw alfalfa standing like this dead brown because the farmers got their water cut off. It was like, okay, is that good planning? <laughs> Right? They planted all this crop and then you know, they, they were told, oh, sorry, your water's cut off, so they couldn't finish it, they couldn't harvest it. So there was hundreds of acres of dead standing alfalfa in the valley. So right there, uh, it's, it's a broken system and uh, we really need to work on it. Corn in the Midwest, alfalfa in California. So let's open up to your questions for Donaga. Anybody have questions? Why not? Because I don't know the farm person. Okay. 
what, how do you think these species are being treated? Well, let's just take, your, your, plant, your food is grown on a farm, right? So what, where's the farm? And what, what was it before it was a farm? Okay, so um, let's take corn. Do you have corn? Rare. Okay, um, how about soy? Yeah, soy. Soy, okay. So is there any soy that's not GMO no, anymore? There's not. No, there's not. Um, is soy a monoculture? Monocrop? Most places, yes. Yeah. Was it previously a native habitat, potentially, of grassland that supported thousands of species, both below ground and above ground, aerial predators, ground nesting birds, grazers? Did it support that prior to being a monoculture soy farm? Yeah, right? And what happened to all those species? They're not there anymore. They're dead, yeah. right? And what happens to the soil <laughs> every time that annual crop gets planted? It's degrading more. It's conventionally grown. It's tilled. Well, I mean, if you're buying soy from a grocery store, typically it is conventionally grown unless you're buying from your neighbor. So, come to my farm, and we don't fence out the deer. <laughs> we invite the deer in. We have massive amounts of ground nesting birds and aerial predators, and our wildlife is abundant. We have biologists coming to our ranch, and they are amazed at how many of these endangered species are present on this land. And yes, cattle are a byproduct of this regenerative ranching restoration. They're a byproduct, and they live, and they breed, and they have babies, and some of them are heifers, some of them are bulls, you need one bowl for every 25 cows. So, yeah, one bowl for every 25 cows. <laughs> so what happens to all the other males? What happens to them? Die of old age? Yeah, yeah, they get slaughtered. And, and it sucks, right? It's, it sucks. And when I first ate my first hamburger, it was on uh, the Pine Ridge Reservation. And I was horrified <laughs> because I hadn't eaten meat my entire life. But it was a culture. You don't refuse food when you're in a, with a native family, when that food is sacred and it was harvested from the land in a sacred way. And it, when you eat that, it becomes part of you. And that's how I view our sacred work, is those animals, I take them all the way till their last day, and I'm with them. And I don't think any other farmer that you might say in a soybean field is going to take those species that they're destroying every day by tilling their soil, by spraying their crops, by fencing out the deer. I don't think they're going to have that same record.